guys, Kim here, and you are tuned in to Kim E, the Diabetes MP. Now today, we're going to jump into food guidelines for the diabetic, okay? Now, I felt like this was very important because we know that we should be educating our patients over what they should eat and we know all about lifestyle modifications it's so drilled into us but to be honest it's still very vague you know we can tell our patients a myriad of things and depending upon the patient some things may work some things may not and so it's really not a clear-cut answer so I did some digging and I did find some really good guidelines by ACE, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and I wanted to just summarize this for you guys because honestly, the article was 82 pages and it wasn't just about diabetes. It was over any endocrine or metabolic disease. So I am going to link that article in the description box just in case you would like to print it off, download it, and read it for yourself because it's a really good piece of information for any metabolic and endocrine um, disease. And as well, I'm also going to link a freebie that I have for you down in the description box. It's a free cheat sheet over just a summary of what the food guidelines are for diabetes. So if this is something that you're interested in, stay tuned. We're going to get into it. So guys, how many times have you heard questions like this? What should I eat as a diabetic? How should I eat? How much should I eat? What kind of foods would help my diagnosis? How many times have you all heard questions that were simple, uh, similar to that or that you get on a day-to-day -day basis? I know for myself, I hear this all the time. And to be quite honest with you, this is probably one of the best opportunities at this moment to talk to your, your, your patients over lifestyle modifications. And I really believe that lifestyle modifications have been drilled into us so much and we can get into this same kind of spiel where we're talking about, oh, you need to exercise regularly, you need to eat healthy. But to be honest with you, we cannot assume that our patients really know what that means, okay? We really need to take the time to really break it down for them. And I believe as providers, sometimes we don't always know, or there's just so many new advances and new updates that come out that it's kind of hard for us to keep up with it. And so, like I said in the intro, I did some digging and I found a very great article that lays out the guidelines by ACE. And I wanted to share them with you, but first, one of the things that I want to say is lifestyle modifications is more effective than any prescription medication that we can give them, any treatment that we can give them. Lifestyle modifications is hands down the most effective when it comes to dealing with diabetes type 2. Okay, so we cannot scale over this. We cannot gloss over it. We really need to take time on a consistent basis to review what lifestyle modifications are, what lifestyle changes are, and what would be best for the patients. It's not a one size fit all, okay? Some people need to focus on certain things where other people don't need to focus on other things. But to be honest with you, when it comes to food, there are some guy there are some obstacles that we are going to face. So let's just examine a few of those things. Now I made a little list here um, so I don't forget. And this was just a list that I came up with just off the top of my head. But even as I'm reading this, think about other obstacles when it comes to food and people in general that we will have to fight through, that we would have to push past for our education for our patients. Now, the first thing I thought of was cost of food, okay? Now, it goes without saying that high quality food is pricey. It's pricey, okay? Now, people can dispute me and say, well, you know, you can find cheap alternatives, but you have to keep in mind that there are things that are in communities that keep people from even having good access to food. One of these things are 
food desert. If you don't know what a food desert is, it's basically exactly what it says it is. In some communities, they don't have grocery stores. Even a simple Walmart or an Aldi is not a close in close proximity to their neighborhood. So many of the people in the neighborhood are forced to have to buy food from a corner store or a gas station or something like that. And we know in places like that, you're not gonna get good quality food. You're not gonna have produce. They're not gonna have fruit. They're not gonna have good cuts of meat in there. It's not a butcher. It's just literally a corner store. There's gonna be a lot of packaged foods in there. You're gonna have chips and snacks and, and, and sweets. The things that we don't want our patients to have. And so, yes, you may have people that can afford good food, but they don't have access to those stores and those places that would offer that. Now, another thing to consider as well is that we all know, it goes without saying, that fresh fruit and vegetables is the optimal option, okay? Well, when when you think about the communities that need this type of resource, would you consider that being in their neighborhoods? Whole Foods and Sprouts are not in the neighborhoods that need them the most. Farmers markets are not necessarily in urban areas. You know, now I am seeing a lot of rise, at least in my city, I'm seeing a lot of people starting to make a change with that. But typically fresh fruit is not readily available, fresh fruit and vegetables. Now your next option is frozen, you know, but people can afford, there are people, there is a demographic that can afford those fresh fruit and vegetables that upfront costs, but we also know that they perish quickly. And so the reason why many people go for your more um, canned foods and, and packaged foods is because that they have a longer shelf life and they need to allow their food, their money to stretch for them. You know, I know for myself, I can afford, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, even frozen uh, fruits and vegetables and the like, all of that. But I know for myself, I have to go and buy those things often throughout the week. What if a patient doesn't have good transportation? What if they don't have the means to be able to go multiple times in a week? Maybe they only have enough for one shopping trip. And so they have to make it stretch. So cost of food, hands down, is a huge obstacle. Another thing is that there's very little attention paid to nutritional counseling, again, um, a lot of times out of sight, out of mind. So if a person is feeling good, if they, if they think that they feel healthy, they don't see the need to really have to eat a certain way. Okay. To even modify their life. You know, many times I've heard patients say, well, I feel good. So I don't know why I have to take this medication. And I know as a provider, sometimes we can get desensitized to that because it's like we're a broken record. We keep talking about it and talking about it and our patients are not changing behaviors, you know? So then after a while, you start putting your emphasis in the things that will get more bang for your buck. Hey guys, I've been there. I know how it feels, you know? And so we really have to push through that, okay? Now, one of the things that I would like to suggest to any provider is whatever demographic that you see, really make it your business to know what kind of grocery stores and resources they have in their area. We tend to have pretty much the same demographic in our clinic. So it's not like you're going to have to figure this out for multiple demographics, depending upon, you know, who comes into your office. You, you're probably going to have to just research this one good time to figure out, is there a Walmart in this area? Is there an Aldi? Is it a Kroger, a Tom Thumb, a Fiesta? Whatever is in your area, it would really help you and your patients to know so you can give them resources. If they don't know what's in their neighborhood, you can actually tell them what's in their neighborhood. And not only that, tell them what healthy alternatives would be. Something else that we have to um, realize is that when it comes to different cultures, you have to really be culturally aware and sensitive to your demographic. Um, there are many cultures who food is the core 
component for everything for them. You know, um, there may be a time of the year where there's a big feast, there's a festival, you know, holidays for many cultures are very big. And if you want your patients to be adherent to your instruction, telling them to like eat nothing but salads or quinoa or vegetables around Thanksgiving or Chinese New Year or Christmas or a huge family celebration, chances are they're not going to adhere to that. So offering them, meeting them where they're at and offering them alternatives. OK, so they don't feel like socially I have to be this outcast. You know, you don't want them to feel that way. You want them to feel like they are a part of whatever celebration is going on, but helping them to make healthier decisions. Another thing to consider as well is that in our society today, we have a very poor relationship with food and that goes for all of us. When we're sad, we eat. When we're mad, we eat. When we're happy, we eat. When we want to celebrate, we eat, okay? And it doesn't help that our media puts out multiple commercials over the most unhealthy foods, okay? So we're having to fight against that, guys. We have to cut through that noise. And these are just a few obstacles that I could just think of off the top of my head, but think about it. Think about your demographic and think about, you know, you take some time and think about it, the obstacles that would be presented when it comes to educating our patients over food and proper nutrition when it comes to their diagnosis of diabetes. So so let's get into some um, numbers and I'm just going to summarize it. And again, I'm going to link the article in the description box so you can read more in depth about it, but I'm just trying to give you the highlighted points. Now, medical nutrition therapy is something that should happen for every diabetic, okay? Every diabetic should have it, okay? And this type of Therapy, this medical nutritional therapy should be done by a physician, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, a dietitian, or a diabetes educator. So in short, someone who is qualified to be able to um, walk a patient through this, any of those positions would be able to do that. And so this is something that as providers, we don't need to gloss over, okay? Uh, MNT, which is medical nutrition therapy, is something that is highly sophisticated. So we do need to know the numbers. And so let me kind of read off the numbers of the overall um, numbers that all of our patients that would apply to all of our patients. Now with the total daily calories, it really should be 15 to 30 uh, kilocalories per kilo per day. So in, in short, if you have a 200 pound patient, that's a, that patient is 91 kilos. Okay. So basically in a nutshell, they should be taking in um, 1365 to 2730 kilo calories a day, okay, over the day, spread out over the day. And the purpose of this total daily calorie is to attain and maintain a normal BMI. OK, and we know what that scale is. We know how we can calculate that. But that's really where this number, what its goal is, is to attain and to maintain a normal BMI. And you won't go wrong with that. So when it comes to protein, you're looking at about a 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram per day. So again, taking a 200 pound patient, which is 91 kilos, you are looking at about 73 to 91 grams of protein a day. Now the protein should um, account for about 15 to 35% of the daily consumption. So when they're looking at their plate, they it should be about 15 to 35% of protein, okay? And your carbs should be about 45 to 65% of what you eat. And while I'm already at it, let me go ahead and tell you what the percentage of the fat is. That's about 30%. So when you're looking at a plate of food, they're saying that you should have about 15 to 35% of that plate should be protein. 45 to 65 should be about your your carbs and your fat should account for 30%. So there are 
are many resources out there with the dietary plate. I'm pretty sure some of you guys have seen it, if not all, where you can actually divide the plate up for them and tell them this, how much should be. It's like, it looks like a pie chart, but it's really a plate. And then you can tell them this, how much should be for your protein. And you can give them examples of what good protein is, animal protein, or even veg, uh, veg, uh, vegetable protein, sorry. And then as well as the carbs going through with them, what would be a healthy carb for them or a healthy fat okay and also one last thing when it comes to the numbers um something else that i thought that was very interesting is that artificial artificial sweeteners are allowed um, within the guidelines of the fda so the fda tells us how uh, we should consume and how much we should consume of artificial sweeteners it is allowed as a diabetic but within reason based off the guidelines of the fda now something very interesting that i wanted to bring up with you guys and again in. It's in the article, but I'm just summarizing this for you. But nutritional strategies when you're dealing with some of the patho changes that a person may have. So let me just read some of this off for you. So if you have a patient that has beta cell dysfunction, okay, and that's going to be a lot of your diabetic patients, what you would want them to do a nutritional uh, strategy for them or a treatment strategy for them would be to avoid excessive carbs and delay the intestinal carb absorption. That is a strategy that you can use for a person who has beta cell dysfunction. Now moving on, someone who has insulin receptor signaling defect, now that's basically that um, the person, the receptor is not registering the, the circulating insulin basically. You would want to attain and maintain a, a healthy BMI. And that goes back up to those numbers that I shared with you, you know, based off of their weight, what would that be, okay? That's what helps get those receptors more sensitive to register the insulin, okay? And then of course, dyslipidemia, you want to decrease the saturated fat in the diet. And then anybody that's at risk for nephropathy, any kidney issues, you would want to avoid salt, protein, phosphate, potassium, and all of this is dependent upon their risk or level and or level of chronic kidney disease, okay? And so I know that I just mentioned protein earlier, but you do have to tread lightly with a patient that has chronic kidney disease, okay? They're a whole nother, that, that's a whole nother beast. But again, in this article, it has it, has it laid out for the person who does suffer with chron chronic kidney disease. And then lastly, accelerated atherosclerosis. The best thing for this is a person to really get a regimen with physical activity. Also somebody um, who um, would need to actually implement some healthy eating. And so again, you know, these are great nutritional strategies for the person um, who has some pathophysiological changes. Now, here's a question that I get so many times from people that are not even diabetics. What is the best diet that we should be eating? And in a day and age where you have so many fad diets, you have so many popular diets that seem to come up every single year. You know what I'm saying? There's so many, they're so numerous, I can't even name them all, okay? I get this question asked all the time. And again, going back to media and TV and stuff like that, people see all of these quick fix kind of diets, you know what I'm saying? And so really honestly, when it comes to the research behind it and as they have taken research, um, the vegan diet is probably one of the more effective diets because it not only prevents diabetes, it also helps improve glycemic control. But let's be honest, if I'm keeping it 100% real with you, many people are not going to want to go vegan. Now, I do think more would go if they really knew what vegan living and vegan diet, what that was. I think more would be more apt to do it. But many people are not going to want to give up dairy products and uh, animal products and meat. Many people are not, okay? And so if that's your one and only strategy, you're going to cut a lot of people out. So really the best approach is just really decreasing poor and unhealthy 
food choices, just ameliorating it, okay? And that's what the article said as well after all of the keto and keto vegan and vegetarian and, and, and Mediterranean, all of them have great benefits. But really in a nutshell, if you just start undoing unhealthy choices, you will see a world of difference. So if you have a patient that eats nothing but fast food, you know, having them to start cooking their food so they can monitor how much salt is put in their food, that they can start getting more vegetables. If you have a patient that, you know, um, drinks all sodas, having them decrease how much that they drink their sodas. One step at a time, you know, small tweaks can lead to huge peaks. Now, the very last thing that I want to mention in this video before I cut it off because it's already getting a little lengthy, but the article does talk about prevention of diabetes and what a person would need to do if they are trying to prevent diabetes. Now, this could be your patient who just wants to be healthier, or this could be a patient that has family history and just doesn't want to go through all the issues that they've seen other family members going through. It did list off some little key points points that they should do. And I'm going to read it off to you. Um, regular physical activity. And we know this to be a minimum of 150 minutes per week. Gone are the days where you're telling people to work out three times a week. Okay. Now, if they are doing, you know, 60 minutes each time, okay, that's fine. But most people are not. You can tell your patient 30 minutes over a span of five days but 150 minutes a week is what is considered the standard. Also voluntary weight loss, meaning that you're looking to lose weight, you want to lose weight and you wanna do it in a healthy way. Um, increasing your fiber, you know, get, making sure that you're regulated. Um, also fish oil and um, the ingestion of fish products. So eating more salmon, eating, you know, taking a fish oil supplement. Now, the thing about this is this is heart protective, okay? And it's a good meat. If you're going to eat meat, this is a good meat to eat, a food, uh, animal product to eat, but it's also heart protective, okay? Also increasing your potassium intake. Again, consider the per the person's kidney function because we read earlier that if they do have kidney issues that you want to decrease the potassium. So do keep that in mind. That may not be uh, appropriate for everyone. And then lastly, low to moderate alcohol consumption. And, um, you know, you really want to keep that low because for one, um, alcohol does cause dehydration. It also, um, it has also been shown to slow metabolism and it also, depending on what they're drinking, can add calories, un, uh, uh, calories that won't do any good for them. Okay, guys, that is all I have for you. That was a lot. This is probably going to be a longer video than I tend to make, but I did want to lay a good foundation um, for you all. And I didn't want to ramble. I kind of feel like I rambled a little bit. So thank you for being patient with me. But I did want to kind of run through this for us all, because I know for myself at times, I have felt like I'm kind of just saying the same spiel every time, you know, eat healthy, work out, eat healthy, work out. But what does that look like practically for my patient? And so I hope that this offered you some good, um, a good starting point. So when you're looking at your patient, patient by patient, case by case, you can tweak it to make sure that it's falling in line with these guidelines. Also, if you have not already, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel here. I put out videos like this every single week, one to two videos every single week. I'm also very active over on Instagram at the Diabetes MP. Do not forget that I did link a free cheat sheet down in the description box that kind of summarizes all of this as well. So if you felt like I was rambling a little bit, hopefully that cheat sheet will help you way more than my ramble. I also link that, as I've said many times, I'm linking that article down in the description box as well. There's one last Thing that I must touch on before we log out here. Let us never, ever leave a nurse behind. Bye guys.